The following video is a presentation of Fairwinds Energy Education. We rely on viewers like you to support our continuing efforts to move energy education forward. Please stay tuned for an important message following this video. If I were to ask you what caused the accident at Fukushima Daiichi, I'll bet you would tell me that an unimaginably large tsunami hit the plant and flooded out the diesel generators. If I were to ask if we moved the diesel generators higher, would this entire accident have been avoided? Again, I'll bet you would tell me that yes, that would solve the problem. And you'd be wrong. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. And today I'd like to talk about the real cause of the accident at Fukushima Daiichi and how close we came, not just at Fukushima Daiichi, but at three other nuclear sites and at 10 other nuclear reactors. On the morning of March 11, 2011, a Richter 9 earthquake out in the Pacific Ocean, about 100 miles off the coast of Japan, caused a shockwave that hit the island. The nuclear plants on the island shut down quickly, and there's inconclusive evidence about whether they really did survive that earthquake or not. But about 45 minutes later, a huge tsunami hit the island and wiped out those nuclear power plants. This is not just Fukushima Daiichi. The wave hit Fukushima Daiichi, Fukushima Daini, Anagawa, and Tokai. And all of them were damaged by the same tsunami. About a week after the accident, I was on CNN. And I told John King that it wasn't about the earthquake and it wasn't about the tsunami wiping out the diesels that knocked out the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. We brought up a satellite video that showed the damage to the pumps along the ocean. And as you can see here, it's just rubble. Now these pumps were relatively strong. They were designed to withstand earthquakes and anything Mother Nature could throw at them. And as you can see, the, the space along the coast it's just a scrapyard of twisted metal. You know in your car, you have a pump on the front of the engine called a water pump. If the water pump fails, your engine dies. Well, that's really what happened at Fukushima Daiichi. Those pumps along the water provide cooling water to the diesels, just like the pump on the front of your engine on your car. And without those pumps operating, the diesels were doomed to fail anyway. It doesn't matter if those diesels were 100 feet in the air. The pumps along the water were destroyed. And that is the real root cause of the accident of Fukushima Daiichi. We call that the loss of the ultimate heat sink. And the key word there is ultimate. You need the ocean to pull the water out of the nuclear reactor to keep it cool. But that same water has to cool the diesels to make that happen. The diesels would not have worked even if they hadn't been flooded. Now this problem that we call the loss of the ultimate heat sink didn't just happen at Fukushima Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. All six reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi site experienced it, but also at the Fukushima Daini site, the Anagawa site, and the Tokai site. Between those four sites, there was 14 nuclear reactors. They had 37 diesels. Nine of them failed because of the tsunami. Those are the ones at Fukushima, Daiichi, one, two, three, and four. But 15 others failed too. Mainstream media isn't talking about that. And the nuclear industry is not talking about that either. The diesels were not flooded. What happened was the pumps along the ocean were destroyed, not just for Fukushima Daiichi 1, 2, 3, 4, but for at every one of those sites, at least one diesel was knocked out because it couldn't be cooled. On December 21st, 2011, a report was written by a Team H2O project, and it discussed what are the lessons that we really should learn from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. It's a long report, 250 pages, and we have it on the website. 
But the key page, as far as I'm concerned, is page 108. There's a really complicated graph on the page, but let me, let me explain it. The pink boxes on that graph are the diesels that were destroyed from flooding. And you'll see the diesels at Fukushima, Daiichi, were destroyed from flooding. Uh, but also, one at Fukushima, Daini, was also destroyed by the flood. More importantly, there are 15 other boxes on that chart that are orange. Those represent the 15 diesels that didn't work, not because they were flooded, but because the cooling water systems had been destroyed by the tsunami. So the nine that failed because they were flooded would have failed anyway because their pumps were destroyed, plus 15 others were destroyed just because they couldn't be cooled. Between the four sites, Fukushima Daiichi, Daini, Anagawa, and Tokai, there were 37 diesels. 24 were wiped out by the tsunami. There's an important lesson here, and the lesson is that it doesn't matter where we put the diesels. We have to put the cooling pumps at the water because that's where the water is. The nuclear industry isn't addressing that. They're focusing on moving the diesels or hardening the diesels or protecting the diesels from flooding. But in fact, the key that has to be resolved here is what are you going to do to protect the pumps along the edge of the water? Now there's another piece to this puzzle that the mainstream media and the nuclear industry don't want to talk about. It's the fact that this accident occurred when everyone was already on the site. There were a thousand people working at Fukushima Daiichi and another thousand people working at Fukushima Daini. Had the earthquake and the ensuing tsunami occurred 12 hours later, there would have been a hundred people working at Fukushima Daiichi and another hundred at Daini about six miles away. The roads would have been destroyed, either by the tsunami or the earthquake, and the people could not have returned to work. It was through Herculean efforts by a thousand heroes at both of those sites that rescued the world from a more serious accident than the one we have already experienced. Think about how bad it would have been if the accident had been in the evening. We would have had 10 nuclear reactors in meltdown and likely other problems at the Anagawa plant and the Tokai plant. So when we talk about the Fukushima Daiichi accident, I think one, it should be called accidents, because we had three nuclear reactors explode and another fuel pool in jeopardy. But also, it wasn't just Fukushima Daiichi. Fukushima Daini was in jeopardy for days. Anagawa was in trouble for more than a day and Tokai also experienced trouble. So there were 14 nuclear reactors in jeopardy on March 11th, and the world instead was focused on Fukushima Daiichi. There's a citizen scientist in Pennsylvania who has suggested, and I think it's a great suggestion, that we add a level to the international nuclear scale to address the fact that when more than one nuclear plant is having an accident, the whole world needs to mobilize to solve the problem. I'm sure you know that Fukushima Daiichi and Chernobyl were both considered level seven accidents, which is the worst that could happen. Adding a level to the international scale on nuclear accidents and adding its level eight accident is not about the amount of radiation released. I think Fukushima Daiichi released somewhat more radiation than, than Chernobyl, but even if they're roughly the same, that's not the point. The point is that it was a multi-unit accident, and it also affected many sites. Well, that affects how many resources are brought in from outside, and that's why Scott Porcelain's recommendation that we add a level to the nuclear accident scale is so important. So Mr. Porcelain is recommending, and I agree with him, that we really need one more rung on the international emergency scale. We need a level eight. It's not about how much radiation was released. It's about when multiple sites or multiple units are involved, 
the accident can be much, much worse than what we encountered. In fact, as I've said, if 12-hour difference in this accident would have very likely meant the destruction of Japan because 2,000 people happened to be there, they were able to rescue plants that were in dire straits. The two lessons for today are one, the nuclear industry needs to move the pumps or protect the pumps with something called submersible pumps so that they work even when they're flooded. And the second piece is that the International Atomic Energy Agency needs to admit that there's circumstances beyond a level seven, a level eight where international cooperation is critical. If only the international community had had a level eight and recognized that it wasn't just a single plant or a single site that was in jeopardy, and that in fact 14 nuclear reactors at four different sites were in jeopardy, the world might have been able to minimize the consequences at Fukushima Daiichi and minimize the exposure to the Japanese population if only the international community had acted faster. Thank you, I'm Arnie Gunderson, and I'll keep you informed. Thanks to contributions from viewers like you, we are able to continue moving energy education forward. This fall, we're asking for your support. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Fairwinds Energy Education and help us continue educating policymakers, the public, and the next generation. Thank you.